Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here, celebrating the joy of this holiday season this year. But it wouldn't be Christmas without John McClane in Die Hard. Yes. Which Bruce Willis plays the role of an NYPD cop who's very slick, charming, and <laughs> he's already in in the wrong place at the wrong time. But this is the crit quintessential of action thrillers that we ever got. It's one of the biggest blockbusters of all time, enough to become a franchise. So we have five movies by far. I know they're going to be planning on doing a a sixth film, which at this rate it was going to be a reboot or something, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I mean, I, I think they're going to call that quits, but I don't know. You know, you know how Hollywood is. They're always going to come up with new changes and they're going to come up with new ideas. But yes, uh, this contains all five films. Uh, not only the first movie, but we got the second film, Die Hard 2, Die Harder. We got Die Hard with the Vengeance. Live Free or Die Hard, which, interesting enough, contains both the unrated and theatrical cuts on Blu-ray. Because they only released the theatrical cut originally. So now they have the option to choose both. That's going to fit on one disc plus all the features. And yes, it has one of the worst uh, Die Hard sequels of all time. A Good Day to Die Hard, which also has... Uh, both the theatrical and unrated cuts. So. so so if you want to be able to see Live Free or Die Hard in both unrated or theatrical for that matter, but at this rate unrated because that's the best cut, get this release. I mean this is worth it. So yes, and it does have the digital codes uh, which I used already, but hey if you have to end up buying the film for yourself then you want to use those codes and go ahead. So, because I got this um, recently at Best Buy for eighteen ninety nine, that was a great deal. I mean, they they do have this for twenty four ninety nine at uh, most places. So hopefully you'll be able to find it. But if you have one of those uh, rewards deals or so, maybe you'll get a chance to get it for cheaper. Um, but I got this on a sale. And I always wanted to get all the Die Hard films anyway. You know, I just never owned them on a physical format like Blu-ray. So, so that's another reason too. Okay. Um, it is kind of disappointing that uh, the first movie, however, could have had um, that one feature that could have been ported directly from the Five Star Collection, and that was The Vault, which had the outtakes, deleted scenes, and other stuff. So all they they carried is just all the ones that were from that DVD release, yet alone the regular DVD release of just um, basically, you know, the newscast, you know, which they showed um, the the late great uh, Mary Ellen Trainer, you know, who was a uh, news anchor and all, and they had the the still gal, which also shows a showcase of how they filmed those scenes, and that's where we got to meet uh, the sleazy uh, journalist named um, Dick uh, Forkwood. And <clears throat> they also have the, uh, yeah, so they have some bloopers and outtakes for that. Plus, they have the still gallery of uh, the props, the models, on set photos of, of the cast and crew, trailers and TV spots, so you get them all. Uh, even the commentary with director John McTiernan, yeah, the same director who did Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jackson D. Cabrera. So yeah, that's all you get, though. Yeah, I, I know it's not said on onto this set, but I'm I'm just reading it uh, directly from Blu-ray.com because that's where I'm getting the information here. I mean, and I know it's a shame that they could do that, but it doesn't fit. Um, but anyway, um, I'm just going to review the first two movies because both of which are indeed Christmas movies. No d debate about it. I don't care what anybody says or any internet article that I have to read. It is essentially a Christmas movie. It's set um, on Christmas Eve. 
Um, even if it's not, uh, you know, snowing or anything like that, still, you know you're in for it. It's not window dressing or anything. I mean, hell, you could probably say that to a Lethal Weapon if you have to. I mean, that could be a Christmas movie, even though most of the time it's just uh, the movie, the plot elements by itself. So at times they don't really focus on Christmas as much. I mean, only in certain scenes. So it could be Wendell dress, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just want to um, get to the first movie, which is Die Hard. And we all know the story, you know, a New York PD, an NYPD a cop, John McClane, he was caught at the skyscraper of Nakatomi Plaza that's held by Hans Gruber, the terrorist uh, that's played by Alan Rickman, and this was his first role. And I know he passed away um, in 2016. Yeah, he's no longer with us, but he's but he was always been an excellent actor. Think about that. I mean, he mostly does a lot of Shakespearean um, plays and stuff. So I mean. If it wasn't for this movie, you know, he wouldn't become a bigger star. And that's when he went on to do films like uh, Quickly Down Under. He played a villain in that. You know, he, he looks exactly like Hans Gruber as a uh, an evil cowboy. So I thought that was interesting. Um, of course, he went on to play the villain, um, you know, Richard, in, in the movie uh, Robin Hood. Prince of Thieves, and he also went on to do, um, you know, Harry Potter, the Her yeah, all the Harry Potter films. Uh, but he was even in the movie uh, Dogma and Galaxy Quest. Yeah, I, I love those films. So, and he's always been a great actor, and I really miss him. And of course, Holly is played by who happens to play the wife of McLean. And he's play, yeah, she's played by Bonnie Bedelia. Yeah, given the last name Gennaro. So yes, you get a team of um, a terrorists, you know, going on a heist, you know, trying to steal six hundred and forty million dollars, and and so on and so forth. So. Uh, they shot this movie at the Fox Plaza, yeah, uh, which is the the corporate office of 20th Century Fox in Century City, California. So they use this as a backdrop. To play in part for the instant, to the internal and ex, external um, shots of the building by itself, the action starts. I mean, even though it's very terrifying, I mean, you do get a sense of vertical right there. And um, and I could definitely see how it, it took the risk to do all these incredible stunts and. It, the fact that they were going to get different actors to play the role, and what's interesting enough, this was actually based on a novel by Robert Fork called Nothing Lasts Forever, which happens to be a sequel to The Detective, um, a novel from 1966, which then turned into a theatrical film in 1968 with uh, Frank Sinatra, you know, the singer, but he's also an actor, and a great actor. Um, very legendary, but... They were going to plan on doing that uh, with Sinatra in mind, but seeing that he, he was in his early 70s at the time, and he was pretty old, that I don't think he wasn't going to be offered to do so, so he he dropped uh, the project. Probably didn't like the way the direction went, or maybe because he had to retire and all. So then... Um, they were going to get other direct. They were going to get other actors like Richard Gere. Yeah, they were going to get Schwarzenegger too because he just did Predator, but he turned it down in order for him to do Red Heat with Jim Belushi and went on to do Twins with Danny DeVito. So that's why. Plus, he was already going to be on the set for the movie uh, Total Recall. And yes, they were going to get other actors. Um, Besides Richard Gere, they they were going to get Harrison Ford, but he had to do uh, Frantic and and um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, not to mention Working Girl. Uh, they were going to get um, uh, Don Johnson, but he 
you know, because he was doing Miami Vice at the time, but he was just doing another film, including the Death of Dead Bane. Uh, so, yeah, even Mel Gibson was going to be chosen for this, uh, you know, seeing that he was doing Lethal Weapon, but unfortunately he was doing, the, of course, uh, getting ready for the sequel. Um, even Sylvester Stallone was going to do this, uh, but he was doing Rambo. And and even the lockup, Richard Dean Anderson. Yes, he was going to do the. This would probably be his first time he ever did an action movie because he was doing MacGyver. But he turned it down. Um, Nick Nolte was um, interested, but mm, he was he just wanted to focus on what he's doing, but other films. So, yeah, and even Burt Reynolds too. And Clint Eastwood, yeah, they, they were going to be able to do this, but Clint Eastwood had to do the, the movie The Deadpool, which is uh, the sequel to all the Dirty Harry films. And Burt Reynolds, of course, was doing action movies too, but he was pretty much doing a lot of those other films that he just decided that he won't be able to have a chance. So all all that leads to Bruce Willis, because he at the time he was doing the TV series... Um, Moonlighting, yeah, was he was known for playing the, a detective named David Addison. It was a TV show with Silver Shepherd, um, but because um, they were given a uh, eleven week hiatus um, due to um, the pregnancy of of co star Silver Shepherd, at the time that he finally gets the chance to um, to play the role of John McClane because he was very interested. He really wanted that role. I mean, the problem was, though, was that he had to turn it down because he, was, he had to focus on the series. And I'm just glad that he got the role because this is definitely the best role that Willis has ever done. I mean, even after doing the two Blake Edwards films, uh, which my favorite of them all, uh, Blind Dates, which he co-stars with... Uh, Came Basinger, uh, joining in with John Larroquette. And yeah, I reviewed that film a long time ago. I loved that film. I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, Sunset is another story, but it's kind of a decent comedy. Um, That's the one where he teams up with James Gardner. Um, but this is the movie that definitely made him an action star. No doubt about it. I mean, think about it. Without this movie... Um, he would never become an action star as we all know and love. I mean, yeah, he wouldn't be able to do films like Pulp Fiction or or any other uh, films that he's done in his career. But he'd probably end up doing like any different types. So, so think about it. You got to give this credit for Die Hard here. Right. And that's why he became one of the biggest blockbusters of all time. You know, I've seen this movie many times, especially when it was on TV, on HBO, and on Fox, and on any channel. But it's always nice to have this um, on Blu-ray. So, it's cool. So I get to watch this in high definition. I know there's a 4K release, too, that's that looks even better. I still wish they had ported all the features from the 5 Star Collection, including... I mean, they did port it, but they, but I do wish they had ported the the last feature. So I I don't know what Fox was thinking, but whatever. I guess I might have to track down that release just for that. So, um, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I am going over the place here. I'm, you know how it is. I, I love to talk more. But let let's get to the review. Um, it stars Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, God rest his soul. Alexander Godunov, um, also God vs. So too. Uh, Bonnie Bedelia, Reginald Bell Johnson, yes, from Ghostbusters, had a small role as um, the, the, the guard uh, at a local jail. Uh, but he went on to play uh, Carl Winslow in the TV series Family Matters. He was also in the movie um, where he plays a, a detective in the movie Turner and Hooch, so yes, that actor. And yes, he later went on to do the sequel. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Paul Gleason from The Breakfast Club. Um, William Apperson, yes, also from Ghostbusters, who played Walter Peck. But this time he plays a, a very sleazy uh, character named uh, Dick uh, Fornberg, or also known as Richard. Uh, Clarence uh, Gilliard Jr., yes, who went on to do the TV series Walker, Texas Ranger. He was also in the TV show Matlock as well. Uh, Hart Bochner, James uh, Shigeta, also no longer with us, but, but he's done like other work uh, such as Walk Like a Dragon, Flower Drum Song, and even did uh, Mulan yeah, as a voice of a character. Um, you also got uh, Robert Davi, um, Grant L. Bush, uh, Dennis Hayden, Andreas uh, Wischkanowski, uh, along with Bruno uh, Dion, and Mary Ellen Trainer, who's no longer with us here. I know I keep doing this. Um, it's written by Jeff Stewart and Stephen E. D'Souza. Yeah, he went on to write um, some other uh, films too to follow. And it's directed by John McTernan who did Predator. He went on to direct uh, Die Hard with the Vengeance, yeah, the third sequel of the series, and then he went on to do films like the remake of uh, The Thomas Crown Affair, and of course the, the Rollerball remake that pretty much ruined his career. Oh, and not to mention, he did direct The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. The movie that started the the uh, Jack Ryan series uh, as a movie series here. The movie began set on Christmas Eve. We meet an NYPD cop, John McClain, played by Bruce Willis, who arrives in Los Angeles, California, to reconcile with his estranged wife, Holly Gennaro, played by Bonnie Bedelia, who works at the Nakatomi uh, Corporation, which held at the 40 stories high skyscraper known as the Nakatomi Plaza in Century City. Um, that's run by the head executive, uh, Joseph Yoshinobu Tagi, played by James Shigeta. Anyway, McLean is being driven by limousine driver uh, Argyle, who's played by uh, Deborah Ox White. Um, and he was already chasing clothes, um, you know, just you know, to get ready. Once he um, enters um, the plaza, you know, he, he goes into that the that computer uh, screen, which uh, actually has a system where you get to choose, uh, you know, where all these uh, office executives uh, are heading. So yes, he chooses. Uh, at first, it was going to be McLean, the last name. But then he looked at Gennaro, because that's the last name that Polly was given. So, so once um, he enters, you know, just already they're celebrating a Christmas party. Uh, he he want to make some contact with his wife, you know, complaining about what's going on and all that. So everything was going fine until the entire party is being uh, disrupted by the arrival of the leader of a German terrorist, Hans Gruber, who's played by Alan Rickman, who sends his team of um, thieves, who are terrorists, including the computer hacker Theo, played by Clarence of Goyard, uh, the two brothers, Carl and Tony Bolesky, both played by Andreas uh, Wineski and Alexander Gordonov, and Yes, and we also have uh, Franco, Alexander, Marco, Christoph, Eddie, Yuli, Henrich, Fritz, and James uh, to join in. So, so they took over the entire. So they took over the entire tower. Um, held them hostage. All except for McLean, because um, he slips away. He was in the bathroom, you know, just you know, changing, but then. Somehow he was trying to find a hiding place to get away from these terrorists. But um, 
It was trying to form a plan to stop him. Um, Argyle, on the other hand, is being stranded inside the parking garage, you know, trying to see what's going on while he's just spending time listening to the, the radio of Christmas music and hoping that he'll be able to get some contact from from McLean. Anyway, Gruber suddenly interrogates uh, Tahagi for the code, so that way they'll be able to enter it so, through the bolts to grab uh, 640 million dollars in, in bonds that they're about to steal. Tahagi refused to cooperate and was shot down, you know, giving a count of free. So they had to play the hard way. So McLean secretly watches um, the event took place, but he accidentally gives himself away and escapes while he sets the fire alarm off and and Gruber is about to send the entire team to look after him, go find him and, and shoot him. So what he did, however, was Tony um, joined in, and then and then John was ready to uh, steal his machine gun and was about to take him down and kill him. He actually stole um, the radio, so that way he'll make some contact. Um, with the, the LAPD, so they'll be able to arrive uh, through Channel 9. Uh, unfortunately, the dispatcher had said that, that it's only available for emergencies only. Yes, and this is where he says, No fucking shit, lady! Did it sound like I'm ordering a pizza? <laughs> and he was just trying to contact them, saying that they already killed one hostage already. There's a group of terrorists that's about to take over the entire tower of Nakatomi Plaza. So he wants to form them to send all, all the reinforcements, all the the, L, the LAPD to actually send some backup and all the rest to stop them. Um, but of course they refused and they asked him that if you're going to do that you got to call 911. But well, he's just trying his best to tell him to actually do this right now, okay? Before he's being shut down by the terrorists yeah, they were all the way on top of the tower so he's trying to escape all the way and ran as fast as he can and hoping that that the authorities will arrive but they're going on the wrong side of the uh, of the location and that's where we meet um, one of the LAPD officers um, Al Powell who's played by Reginald Bell Johnson and he's he's actually the only good cop out there, even though um, he was just going around, you know, getting some uh, Twinkies at at a local A and P M, just getting, you know, actually getting some for his wife, and also, you know, getting some gas, only to note that yes, he just received a call from the Nakatomi Plaza, um, hoping that this was going to be the call from McLean, so he just came in. So he's trying to look out to see what's going on, and and then next thing you know, because um, McLean was trying to warn him, because he was just driving around in circles and stuff to see what's happening. Um, he just killed uh, Marco and the other uh, terrorists, and and he actually dumped his body all the way down, you know, from the floor. And straight into his police car. And yeah, that's where he says, Welcome to the party, pal! And, and then suddenly, um, uh, Al Parel's car just suddenly went all the way backwards. Uh, and fell all the way down to where the garage is. So, and figuring that maybe he'll be able to call for backup so they'll arrive. And yes, and that's where we got the LAPD enforcements to show up. And they even join in with... FBI agents too to take command of the siege that's going on. So yeah, yeah, including the the SWAT uh, armored car that they brought in. Yeah, the the leader of the um, the LAPD, of course, is who's the chief of police is um, Dwayne T. Robinson, played by Paul Gleason. And yes, um, the characters of the cops, yes, and even the the dispatcher were incredibly dumb. I mean, no doubt about it, they were incredibly stupid. 
Um, but it didn't hurt the film because that's exactly what their operation had to go. But McLean, of course, is just already getting stuck inside each floor, trying to escape from them, trying to kill those uh, terrorists, you know, before um, hoping that he'll be able to get what he, what he can, uh, trying to warn them what, what's happening, not to mention um, this is where he also made contact with uh, Hans Gruber in, in that most memorable scene which actually gave us the the famous catchphrase, yes, was when he was, because after he just stole the radio and, and the machine gun, yeah, which he actually sends uh, uh, Tony down to the elevator and, you know, just put in a, a sweater and a, uh, a Santa cap and, he, and it just wrote down, I have the machine gun, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> um, anyway. So the most memorable scene of them all was when he makes contact with Hans and you know he was just explaining that you're just an American like you know like one of, who's seen many of those uh, cowboy films you know westerns like like Marshall Dillon or Gary Cooper and all but he says he was impartial to Roy Rogers actually then of course he says the line do you think you have a chance against us Mr. Cowboy and then that's where he says the line yippee ki -yay, motherfucker! Just when the elevator uh, lights go on, you hear the sound. And he was ready to go up on the elevator and stuff. To kill more. And so there's even a, a moment too where... Um, because um, he also took the, uh, the C4 detonators and all the other explosives included inside the bag when he killed uh, you know, Marco and the rest. He sends out uh, an office uh, chair, which he hooked it up with the C4 detonator and, and wrapped it around with a computer monitor to actually dump it straight into the elevator shaft. And that's when, <laughs> that's when you have like a huge explosion that blasts all the way up from the top. Uh, John was ready to get away from, from that blast and he just jumps up and the blast hits and and I know um, Carl was like saying that they actually they use a totally on us and Hans just says you idiot it's not the police it's him <laughs> so anyway and yeah that happens after uh, Jason James and Alexander was using the anti-tank missiles to disable the SWAT armored car. And so, because already, you know, they were using rocket launchers to shoot um, the armored car. So, they're almost a route to kill them, too. Okay. Um, so, McLean refuses to prompt Gruber to execute Elias. Who happens to be the the co worker of Hall of Holly, and he's played by um, and he's played by uh, Hodge Bochner. Yes, he, I mean he's very sleazy. Um, you know he snorts some coke and everything. He was going to try to make a deal with him to to stop this, but it was too late. So he got killed. Uh, then there's a news report that's being joined in by a a very sleazy but also um, an arrogant uh, reporter named Richard Fornberg or Dick is played by William Apherson so no matter what reports that he always give him he's, he's going around you know filming the the scene of the Nakatomi Plaza you know all this um, all this chaos going around all terrorists you know giving what they want it, all shot live and then even worse he starts to go straight into Holly's uh, house, you know, where we have a uh, a maid that's that's taking over, that's uh, taking care of of John and Holly's kids, you know, Lucy, uh, yeah, including the Lucy McLean and John Jr. Yeah, so they had to broadcast that live. Well, any other order, so.
he got the most famous scene of them all too uh, was when Hans was about to send uh, along with the group of the terrorists to send all the hostages all the way on top of the roof only to note that um, the roof is being the, armed with uh, detonators, you know, C4 detonators, and plus um, they sent out the FBI agents, uh, both played by um, Robert Davi and Granell Bush, are playing Big and, and Little Johnson. <laughs> yeah, go figure. Um, so they were going to sh show up so that way they'll be able to stop the, the terrorists, but they ends up shooting uh, John just when he was already up. You know, he's He's all uh, he's all shirtless. Um, he just already got caught um, with glass uh, on his feet. You know, having to walk through glass ever since he he met uh, Hans for the first time. You know, before he had to take down um, you know, Carl and and the and the other terrorists. You know, they had a violent shootout around. Um, yeah, there's a moment there I'm gonna explain after. He was telling all the the hostages to go downstairs because um, there's going to be an explosive and he was also telling them where Holly is and she's around all the other floors uh, all the way down so then the the FBI agents was shooting him down he was like telling them I'm on your side assholes and then he has to somehow jump out of the the tallest building of them all by wrapping himself up with the fire hose uh, into his his waist so that way he'll be able to jump up and be able to go directly to the next floor and he did and, and the entire top of the roof explodes um, but it did actually kill the the agents uh, through the helicopter um, and then yes he, he swings around into the next floor you know he you know, he takes uh, the guns and just shoots the glass window and just breaks in and he almost uh, slipped all the way down uh, from the wheel but he held on so so luckily you know he was alright but then he continues to fire on all these other terrorists um, and then he actually uh, takes uh, some wrapping paper to wrap up on his gun so that way he'll be able to find Holly that's being uh, held by Hans and yes, this is where he, he goes up, and this is where he, he's ready to to kill Hans along with uh, the other terrorists. Before this happened, Theo actually went straight into the getaway vehicle, which happens to be the ambulance, um, before Argyle actually spotted him, uh, took out his limo, and, and crashed straight at him and knocks him out cold hoping to capture him and ready to send him to the police. But back to the scene with Hans, uh, with Holly and, and John, was that now um, he did shot uh, Hans, and he says, Happy trails, Hans, and then he, he fell, he was about to fall all the way down into the biggest skyscraper of them all. He was holding the Holly together, and then and then he was gonna ready to shoot uh, both John and Holly, and and John was about to have Holly let go of the the bracelet, or at this rate the watch. And then suddenly, Hans fell all the way down from the Nakatomi Plaza. He drops all the way down in this wonderful uh, close-up shot, because you could pretty much tell they use a, a blue screen effect to create that scene. But it was just amazing to see that shot where he falls all the way down and yes um, Dwayne actually says I hope that's not a hostage but nope it's just Hans falling all the way down to the skyscraper and, and landed down on the ground and he was dead and so now both uh, John and and Holly are safe along with um, the rest of the other hostages so so the only ones that were killed were just two. So the rest were saved um, until uh, by the end of it all, um, Holly did actually punch uh, a dick in the face. Yeah, he deserved it. 
after illegally uh, going straight inside uh, Holly's house that he wasn't supposed to be, you know, evasion of privacy. So, uh, and, oh, and also, um, um, Al actually got to shoot um, Kyle too at the end, yeah, because he actually lives. Um, because there, there was a scene in the movie where uh, John actually beats the shit out of him. Yeah, just when he was beating the shit out of him. And and <laughs> and he actually wrapped him up, uh, hooked him up uh, in, inside the middle of the floor of what's supposed to be the construction that they were building in. Yeah, so they beat the crap out of, of, out of each other. So hoping he did kill them, like held him out, but he actually did got out of there and and came down ready to shoot John. So thank goodness uh, Al, you know, saved their lives. Yeah. So nice ending to to this movie, and no doubt about it, it's it's one of the best action movies ever made, and no doubt about it, also it's a Christmas movie, and it's going to stay that way. Anybody who says it's not a Christmas movie is totally insane. Bruce Willis, no doubt about it, the best role that he ever played as John McClane. You know, definitely wisecracking, giving us some some great one-liners that you'll never forget. You know, he's crazy, but he can definitely <laughs> do his job to take down every single bad guy out there that's inside the Nakatomi Plaza. Um, and some great and Hans Gruber definitely a highly intelligent uh, terrorist uh, who definitely uh, can push everyone's buttons and he can do exactly what he was told but if you don't cooperate he's gonna shoot you after you count to free you know I mean no matter and plus you know he's very powerful and and, and I'm it's really the best role that you can ever offer. I mean, this is a character that you love to hate, but nevertheless, you love. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, but the best moment, too, was when um, when John uh, first met uh, Hans um, onto the floor, uh, where he actually acts like he was just somewhat of a, <laughs> like another hostage as an office executive, and and he was give, given an, an American accent that he was doing. And uh, now, from what we learned, though, he actually did um, injured his uh, leg uh, while doing this scene because he actually jumped out of a out of the the building, yeah, right into the floor. Yeah, I, I think he had to drop on a higher uh, level too. So he did uh, injured his leg, and he was actually doing that one particular scene in that moment when. Um, uh, first, he was um, he he acted like he was American um, office executive, and then and then he was <laughs> then John was telling them to calm down, and he was given a uh, a different name, claiming that he's uh, he's Clay. John was giving him a cigarette and giving him a gun too, and he even said. You know, I was invited to a Christmas party by mistake. Who knew? <sighs> the next thing you know, yes, um, it, it was Hans the whole time. And yeah, he says, well, 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 Hans. Yeah. And he tells him to get me the detonators. I'm like, um, I don't have the detonators because I already used them all. And he's saying, I'm going to count to three. Just like what you did to Tagi, and he just tries to shoot him, and then and he says, "No bullets." What do you think? I'm stupid, Hans. And then at the end, he says, "You were sane." Just when the terrorists arrived, <laughs> and they has a violent shootout. I mean, wow, that that's just some moment right there. Impressive acting too. Um, uh, the rest of the cast was great too. I mean, Bonnie Bedelia. Um, very beautiful as a Holly. Um, I mean, you could definitely tell what she's been going through, but yet, you know, she's she's doing her best to survive. Um, 
Original Bill Johnson was also excellent as um, Sergeant uh, Al Powell. I mean, I, I love the moments between the John and and Al uh, while they're making contact on the radio. Um, although <laughs> at first, you know, they're he was pretending like he's Roy Rogers, so he was just you know sucking them up and getting to know each other very well. So it was really cool. So it's always like, yeah, he's, he's starting to make friends with him and. So it's always nice to see a sergeant who's actually very smart. Um, but the rest of the cops, of course, yeah, I know, including Dwayne T. Robinson. Yeah, they were pretty dumb. Um, but hey, I, I can deal with that. I mean, hey, I mean, no one's perfect here. Um, but I, I kind of like how they, it goes for like a fish out of water story in a way. I mean, because think about it. You know, a New York cop wants up going straight to another city. That isn't exactly what he experienced. But he knew that he likes his city better than than we do. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. So even though I live in a different area uh, as part of Los Angeles. So I, I guess, you know, we all have uh, different things in common, you know, because we have like, you know, we have like sunny beaches around. And, um, I mean, yes, we do have snowy mountains and, and there are other places that have snow too, but we don't often get snow in downtown LA, right? so of course not. You know, like people say that it never rains in Southern California, but they do rain. <laughs> Um, but no, we we do get rain though, but and we do get some snow in in certain areas, but but we also get a lot of hot sun. Yeah, warm beaches, you know, you know, and <laughs> everyday life in offices. I mean, yes, I mean we all we also get gains, street gains around, and a lot of crime going around, but. But you do get a lot of uh, nice um, skyscrapers uh, in the area. That's very similar to New York. So, but what's the case? Some great cinematography that was actually done by Jean de Bont, who later went on to direct Speed and Twister. Yeah. Also, uh, they even had the editor Stuart Bayard, who later went on to do the movie Executive Decision that he direct. Yeah, he also directed US Marshals too. So he definitely knows the style of action movies. But yes, it has incredible stunts, uh, no doubt about it. A lot of explosives in the movies. And I and it was very impressive the way they'd done all this. I mean you can pretty much tell that at times uh, Willis had done his own stunts, uh, although I'm pretty soon they would have used a stunt double too for maybe half of it. Um, but they actually did it on set. You know, they did use some blue screen effects and then they did use some other certain effects that's not on a blue screen but it's on location. So they're hoping that, you know, they'd be able to get the job done as soon as they can. And hoping that no one will get hurt. I mean, because of all the risk of having to jump out of a skyscraper or getting killed and all. But yeah, I mean, it was one of the biggest blockbuster hits um, during the summer of 1988. I mean, you know, it had a lot of screens around and the audience were very applaud and they were very um, incredibly impressed. I mean, it was, in, it was incredibly stunning that they actually saw an action movie with style and and everything that they went for. Um, and it definitely works well, even if it, even if you could watch this at, at different times, I mean, even on Christmas Day, or Christmas Eve for that matter, and, or the holiday season. And also it's the movie that, um, inspired by pretty much several rip-offs of all these, uh, you know, terrorist movies or any other. I mean, there's been like so many movies that, that pretty much ripped this off of. I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, you got films like Cliffhanger, um, you got Speed, you got Under Siege, along with its sequel, 
got sudden death, broken arrow, executive decision, con error. I mean, yes, even Speed 2, Air Force One. I mean, there's like so many other movies that deals with that, you know. I mean, if it wasn't for Die Hard, I mean, we would never get any of those other films or even those other copycats that follow, like Skyscraper. Yeah, I mean, both the Anna Nicole Smith movie and, and even the Dwayne Johnson, a.k.a. The Rock, which blends in with the Towering Inferno. So. Um, and plus, you got some Christmas songs to throw in, too, especially the song um, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow by Bon Moreau. Um, even got a 1DMC song, Christmas and Hollis. Uh, they even got Winter Wonderland and all that. But most of all is when they had the Ninth Sympathy by Beethoven. And that's often used uh, <laughs> in the movie trailers too and TV spots and stuff. So no doubt about it, Die Hard is an awesome action picture classic that you'll never forget. I mean, it has excellent writing by two writers, Jeff Stewart and Stephen E. D'Souza. They did an excellent job um, adding all numbers, dialogues, and all that stuff. And and you gotta get credit to John McTernan because he did an, an amazing job with his direction. I mean, he did his best to do so after his success with Predator. And also because I know he's trying to do his best to avoid the politics of, of you know, terrorists. He didn't even want to refer to them at first. He rather referred to them as fees, which that's understandable. But nevertheless, yes, I mean, this was wow, amazing. Um, so, always um, check this out. So anyway, that's Die Hard. Um, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and yippee ki motherfucker.